Hello, and thank you for uh, joining this slideshow. I'm going to be covering two aspects, really, an urban development project run by the late Dr. Jemba Tefra in Addis Ababa, and then com something completely different, going down the Rift Valley towards the border with Kenya and uh, looking at some wildlife. Although there's quite a lot of slides, I'm aiming to get through them in about 45 minutes. And at the end, I'm hoping you'll be uh, amazed, not only the extent of Christian work going in on amongst the poor in Addis Ababa, but also the uh, wonders of creation out in the rural areas. Well, just to set the scene, as you may know, Addis Ababa is set in a very rugged part of Africa. The capital city of Addis Ababa is situated at 10,000 feet and the Rift Valley is some 5,000 feet above sea level. Those who've seen the previous two slideshows on Ethiopia will remember that the first slideshow was about a visit in 1994, and then in 2000, we were able to visit the Lalibela's rock churches. So this is the overall structure of what I'd like to cover. Going back to the origins of Glenfall Fellowship, which is how we came to form this relationship with Ethiopia. The lady on the left there, Liz Scotland, was at school with Jemba Tefra, the Ethiopian lady in the middle. And the gentleman on the right is Reverend Dr. Nigel Scotland. This relationship between Glenfall Fellowship and the Integrated Holistic Approach Urban Development Project goes back a long way to about 1989 and we've received regular updates from the project to keep us involved prayerfully and in terms of financial giving and visits and this is one of our friends Chris Hughes who rode from Land's End to John O'Groats to raise some money for the project one of many activities going on at that time so the visit itself was between the 13th and 24th of August. This is a map of the city of Addis Ababa. And over on the right, there's the race course where you may remember I previously showed slides of the Epiphany celebrations. By 2004, the city was being transformed somewhat, as you can see skyscrapers emerging. This was the headquarters of the African Union, like the United Nations for that continent. Uh, the bank, Central Bank for Ethiopia. And here's an example of the currency known as the burr. At that time, there were about 15 burr to the English pound. Some of the shops and the children are one of the most rewarding aspects of visiting the country there. So full of joy and curiosity. It's a big novelty for them to see pictures of themselves in the, the camera like that. Margaret and I, along with our friend Ben Booth, stayed uh, across the city from the race course in Jemba's own home. And this was where her husband uh, Haile Georgis had been Lord Mayor of Addis Ababa as well as Minister for Transport in the cabinet of uh, Emperor Haile Selassie. Sadly, by this time, uh, Haile Georgis had, had died. But this is the compound, a series of buildings with a, a little farm in the middle. And we were staying in one of these. Jembers has a real heart for the poor, but everybody needs some privacy. So this gentleman here was responsible for letting people in and out through the gate. Quite comfortable inside. We got chatting to a couple working in the slums of uh, Johannesburg who happened to be staying there at the time. And then Jemba took us out on a tour around the city. This is a typical scene. Whenever the car stopped, as happened here, then immediately, there would be people uh, wanting 
money or support. And the way Gemba dealt with that was by giving them food vouchers so that they could go to a shop and uh, pick, pick up what they needed there. By contrast, the Sheraton Hotel in Addis Ababa is quite westernised, very westernised. Gemba took us there for afternoon tea. And elsewhere, you can see the architecture is gradually shifting away from the slums and into something much more modern. By this stage, the projects that Gemba had been working on, IHA UDP, had started to um, hand over responsibility to different local organisations. This one's uh, called Sabisto, Community-Based Integrated Sustainable Development Organisation. And here's a picture of a little shop in the shanty town around the, the centre of the project. The people were very grateful to get clean and reliable, safe drinking water. And Jemba was working in those days with water aid for that to happen. She was also putting up new homes. Big improvement, I'm sure, from the corrugated iron that the people had been used to living in. And they're even planting gardens for them. And they were doing much, much of this work themselves. They just needed a little bit of support to get them going. There was also some major building work going on, again, led by Gemba, to put up condominiums because the city authorities weren't very keen on spreading out across the ground and they wanted to make better use of the land by building upwards. Some of the scaffolding here looks very uh, unsafe by Western standards, but it seems to be holding up. And again, here's some of the building techniques, which you don't see very often in Gloucestershire. Uh, <laughs> that would be going back to the medieval times, I think. But again, it seems to do the job. Some of the people uh, benefited from the job creation activities. And here are the characteristic Ethiopian baskets, which Tear Fund and Trade Claf to, and other organisations have brought over to us in recent years some handicraft and sewing work. These ladies had been rescued really from a life on the streets and given new skills to, um, to support themselves. Here we are sorting through some of the grain. And this is a blaze of color, a little shop at the side of the street there. Two little faces beaming out from lower down. Another aspect of Gemba's work was caring for the elderly and on our trip we were able to visit old people's midday meal. In fact we're now old OAPs ourselves, Margaret and I. These, these older people don't have pensions of course like we do in the West and rely on their, their families who are also struggling for support. So this initiative um, is, is a great help to them. Jemba's work also encompasses caring for children. She was able to involve a Christian charity in Holland who built a whole new school for the kids and staffed it as well. So th this is fantastic work really. And the school and the uh, library in, in one of the uh, Cabelis or villages as they're known is, was very well equipped with, uh, with books. Margaret and I had been sponsoring a child, Fantanesh, along with many others who were part of this child sponsorship scheme, but we were delighted to be able to meet our uh, sponsorship child. And she's gone on since then uh, to do great things, supporting herself and her family in various ways. And here's the minibus that our church, Glenfall Fellowship, helped to pay for. Well, I'll move on quickly now to the next part of the talk. And it's really Jemba's initiative in bringing all the churches together in Addis Ababa, the main denominations anyway, in a project to help care for the urban poor. And this is a building that was 
her initiative, the Institute for Urban Workers. Um, something else is going up over on the right there. You can see uh, people working on dodgy looking scaffolding. And the Institute for Urban Workers gives out various uh, certificates for those who attend training courses and pass the exams. So here are some vehicles coming into the compound at the start of the conference. And so I just want to show a few slides about the conference, which was very um, challenging and a very high standard. I say it was challenging just from the point of view of realising the Christian responsibility to care for the poor and something that we sometimes just pay lip service to, but when you actually know people like Gemba who are working amongst the poor, it makes it much more motivational to keep involved. There's a welcoming committee. And inside the Institute, big lecture hall, some of the local dignitaries. Gemba initiating the, uh, the conference, welcoming people, then taking a seat alongside Lula Besha, that's a, literally a right-hand support person. Various preliminaries of some amateur dramatics, a choir, and then Ray Backey, who's a, a clergyman from Chicago, also based in Seattle. And he's one of the most remarkable people I've ever met, but he, his knowledge of the culture in Ethiopia is quite amazing. And he had a real vision for Bible-based mission amongst the urban poor. We broke into various little groups, work groups. I think this one, we were tackling the problem of uh, prostitution. Not that I know anything much about that, but uh, we had to report back in due course. A wonderful spread of food available. And this is the publicity agent for the work that Jembu is doing, young lady. And we also got the opportunity to visit some of the other urban development projects. Jembu's is one of the leading, but there are many others, including uh, this one where girls who fall pregnant and would otherwise be thrown out of their home and living on the street are uh, given a safe place to live in these old containers off ships. The guy who had this vision, I mean, it's remarkable. I think he was a Pentecostal guy. And what a difference it makes to these young girls and their kids. The Institute was still being finished off as we arrived for the conference. And then afterwards we stayed on, I think it was about a week of teaching on Christian urban development run by Ray Backey. We also visited the local Anglican church. Yes, even in Addis Ababa, the Anglican church has got a present. This is, this is St Matthew's Church over near the British Embassy. And you could feel quite at home there. I think this was the Roman Catholic Church, Ethiopian Orthodox Church. I don't know who that gentleman is there reading the Bible on that statue, but uh, there's so much to take in, really in a short visit like this and here's the Pentecostal church I mentioned briefly before we just popped in there for a few minutes to say hello then a coffee ceremony that's a big part of the Ethiopian culture roasting the fresh beans and there are three different types of concentrations of coffee that come out of all that each with its own distinctive flavour depending on how long it's brewed for so somewhere in there is Margaret. Yeah, there we are in the white towards the bottom of the steps. And these are all the people who are on the training course. Well, at last, we're going down the Rift Valley. Thank you for bearing with me through all that. The Rift Valley runs south from Addis Ababa for about 400 miles to the border with Kenya. And there's a series of lakes. I've shown it there in a kind of road map on the left. Well, it's another road map, I suppose, on the right, which gives a bit more topography in, in colour. And we're heading down to a place called Arbor Minch between Lake Abaya and Lake Charmo. Yes, well, Ethiopia hasn't got the safest roads in the world uh, by any means, but uh, there's an example of something that went wrong. One thing I did notice, though, was that 
the road was downhill for about 80 or 100 miles. And so you could set off on your bike, say, from Addis Ababa and just not pedal at all until you got into the Rift Valley, some 5,000 feet lower down. I don't know whether that's going to make it onto my bucket list, but it was a nice idea at the time. A view of life in the Rift Valley, as you'd expect, quite a lot of farming going on, sort of techniques that were around before the Industrial Revolution in England, herding the, the cattle. And I thought of uh, back here in the Cotswolds, how the Greenway Lane, which some of you may know, running up from Sherdington into the Cotswolds has been worn down by the hooves of animals over centuries. And the same thing's going on here, right alongside the relatively new main road into one of the little bustling towns down the Rift Valley. Time for a brew. Although it's not a cup of tea that we would recognise. In fact, I think this is a coffee we're having. And at last, we're starting to see some, some wildlife here. Now, I'm not entirely sure what all these birds are. I think these might be vultures, but you'll have to forgive me if I make some mistakes. Yeah, these are definitely vultures. Well, it's actually the bearded vulture. It's a scavenger feeding mostly on dead animals, and I'm sure you know. It's the only known vertebrate whose diet consists almost exclusively of bones. And it has a wingspan of between seven and nine feet, often seen at refuse tips on the outskirts of small towns and villages. They pick up bones up to a quarter of their own body weight and carry them up into there. And then they drop them onto rocks far below to break them into smaller pieces so they can get at the bone marrow. There are two rainy seasons in Ethiopia in January and in August. And we were there in August, as I say, during the rainy season, but did have the advantage that we were able to see some of the, the extraordinary bird life. So here we have uh, an egret and a goliath heron, I'm reliably informed. This spectacular bird, little blue bird, is known as the greater blue-eared glossy starling. Amazing. And I'm sure you recognise these as fish eagles, also known as the African sea eagle, with a distinctive white head and partially white tail with dark wings. And the wingspan of the male is up to six foot six, but the female is even more at seven foot nine inches. Feeding habits are opportunistic, eating fish as well as the water birds. So I'm not sure what this is. I've, Margaret and I have tried to look it up, but um, there are a lot of bird species in Ethiopia, some 867 different bird species. So eventually we got down the road and we arrived at Lake Abaya. The time for a drink of Premium lager beer was the best we could get. Well, here's one of the meals we had. This is uh, soup, I think. Our driver over here on the right, a Shetu, was a Muslim, and uh, he struggled. He'd driven for eight hours to, to get to that point. Some 350 miles of driving on relatively uh, low-grade roads. This is the lodge we were staying in, by the way, overlooking the Rift Valley. Must have been about a 200 foot drop just beyond that uh, external lighting you can see. Quite a comfortable lodge. And then the next day we set out going down uh, into the Rift Valley itself. So we're heading off now into the, hope I can pronounce this right. Nekisa National Park and Lake Charmo. So we'd been staying at Arba Minch, which is that little bit of, it's a town on that little bit of land between Lake Abaya and Lake Charmo. I don't know why the satellite picture shows Abaya 
looking relatively muddy and Charmo looking like it's covered in algae. But uh, anyway, and the Nakisha National Park is a, reached by going across that little spit of land between the two lakes. So I think Ashetu handed over to a different driver now because we had to be escorted into the park with armed guard. There had been some trouble with, between uh, the, the, the different tribes and also the, the government authorities. You can see quite a rugged track, but an amazing landscape. I think this must be a baboon, I've not looked it up. Shortly after seeing this, uh, the, the armed guard spotted some people on a track similar to this and he jumped out of the car, got his rifle and he butted them with the, the rifle butt and encouraged them to leave the park because they were, weren't supposed to be there. However, there was another group of people who were coming out of the park who apparently had no trouble at all with air access. So we're not too sure what was going on. But as you'd expect with a, a game reserve, we, there were some animals. Here we have the, the zebras. This is a Greve zebra, also known as the Imperial Zebra. And it's the largest living wild horse. And it's the most threatened of the three species of zebras, the other two being the plain zebra and the mountain zebra. And it can survive for up to five days without water. Since the 1970s, the population has declined from 15,000 to about 3,000, but is now stable. And as you can see, the grevy is relatively tall, has large ears, and stripes are a bit narrower than some other uh, zebras. Lives in semi-arid grasslands where it feeds on the grass. And here we came across some impala, medium-sized antelope up to three feet high, and then you can add another 18 inches to three feet because of their long antlers. They like to be close to water, eat grass, plants and fruits, and they feed and rest during the evenings and at night. These uh, impala are plentiful and not at risk of extinction at the present time. Massive termite hills and beyond you can see some huts which you might not have expected to see there certainly it was a surprise to us and we learned that um, there was a constant battle between the authorities trying to establish a park for tourism and the local tribes who'd been evicted from there who kept returning they're nowhere else to go. And we went inside the, uh, the hut, had a look round and found some pots and pans that had been abandoned. And then a few, few weeks later, we realized that the authorities had uh, burned down some of those huts in a final bid to clear the park. They were actually hauled up in front of the uh, uh, international authorities for, I wouldn't say a crime against humanity, but something like that was going on. So it was a conflict between the local people and the government that wanted to bring in big animals into that game reserve to attract tourists like ourselves. So it raises all sorts of ethical issues, really, which have been in the back of my mind ever since. Well, after visiting the Nakisha National Park, we then had some lunch and went to what's known as the Crocodile Market on Lake Charmo. The word Crocodile Market conjures up sort of leather goods, doesn't it? And, uh, you know, handbags and shoes, but it wasn't quite like that at all. There was nothing for sale like that. It was more of an eco boat ride. This is just showing some of the people who live in that area who are outside the national park and can live in relative peace simple lifestyle fishing and farming anyway to get to our 
little boat, we had to walk out across the uh, the pier and then clamber into a boat probably about 15 or 20, maybe 20 feet long. And before we knew it, we were right up alongside Nile crocodile. Uh, this was a bit scary, really, because they, uh, well, they're big creatures. They're um, 14, the male is 14 feet long. They normally eat fish, mammals, I suppose that includes humans, really, uh, dead things floating around. Uh, their feeding habits are aggressive and opportunistic. Well, we knew all that before we went, and we were just wondering how aggressive and opportunistic they were going to be. <laughs> anyway, I took some comfort from reading that they prefer to have their main meal after five o'clock at night. And we were mid-afternoon, so we should be all right. Hippos also popping up alongside the boat. Uh, hippos normally eat grass. The males weigh up to three tonnes. They are known to be one of the most um, uh, aggressive creatures on the planet. When they're out, out of the water, they can run at up to 35 miles an hour. So that was something to bear in mind. But they do spend most of the day in the water standing on sandbanks. But they ever so often, they would all bob, bob underwater and come up next to the boat or just underneath it. And I started to imagine what would it be like to be thrown into the water with all these hippos? Were they going to be friendly hippos or not? They can hold their breath for up to seven minutes underwater. And when they open their jaws like that, they're not just yawning. It's a warning not to get any closer. Hippos apparently have a lifespan of up to 50 years. Slightly menacing expression there. Not that I'm an expert on hippos' expressions, but you know what I mean. I must say that these, uh, the best of these wildlife slides were taken uh, by our friend Ben Booth, who had a digital SLR. Now we're on to the uh, white, great white pelicans. And there were thousands of these alongside the crocodiles and the hippos. They have a long pink and yellow bill and a large throat pouch used for catching prey and draining water from the scooped up contents before swallowing. The wingspan of the adult bird is between six foot and 11 foot. So it's a big bird leaves its nest in the morning and may fly up to 60 miles in search of food. It is a highly sociable bird, vulnerable to crocodile attack whenever sitting in open water. And they have a lifespan of between 15 and 25 years. Well, we were glad to get back to our hotel safely after all that excitement. And here we're about to be tucking into a Nile perch which is a big fish and uh, quite tasty. The next day we set off for a place called Sodo, which is back up the road towards Addis Ababa. And there, there was an open market up in the hills. Yeah, a lot of activity going on. We were able to visit one of the traditional homes of the local people. Might be home to them, but it didn't feel very homely to me. They seem to be into gourds, which I think are a plant that they scoop the contents out of and use for uh, as bowls. And I did buy a hat from this gentleman. I've still got it. I should be wearing it now, really. It only comes out on special occasions. It's like a Jewish skull cap, if you know what I mean. Tear Fund were working amongst this community. We were quite impressed with what we saw. Next, as we head back towards this Addis Ababa, we stopped at a place called Wando Gennet. And Wando Gennet is right next to a town called Shashemini. How about that? Shashemini. And you see Wando Gennet just next to it there with some lakes. And it's here that the Rastafarian community have their main base. 
they don't like to be invaded by tourists, so we just caught glimpses of them. But uh, you may know that they regard regarded Emperor Haile Selassie as um, a god. And part of their worship is to smoke uh, marijuana. I think it's going to be a while before that catches on in the Sea of E, though. We stayed at um, the Wabe Shebele Hotel and uh, we were in amongst various monkeys, which made life interesting. They're a little bit mischievous, these creatures. Our driver, Ashetu, who you saw earlier, was suffering from severe back pain. But there are some hot springs in the hotel grounds and he was able to get some relief by uh, standing under this this spout of hot water and uh, and feeling the relief that came from that. We then go on to the next day to Lake Koka, which is well on the way back to Addis Ababa. And here, I think this is actually a volcanic crater that's that's become a lake. Here, Ben, who was mentioned earlier, who was with us from Cheltenham, took some very nice pictures of the plants and particularly the weaver birds. These are fantastic creatures, various species in Ethiopia, all brightly coloured, and they weave nests in close proximity to one another, starting off with a circle of uh, vegetation and then building out from that really clever and there's always a little doorway at the bottom which they uh, they go up and feed the chicks this is one that i got out of a, a book but there we have a really good picture of uh, an insect being exchanged from mother to chicks Well, by this stage, we're almost back in Addis Ababa and see our friend, Dr. Jemba Tefra, who uh, was, who'd invited us over in the first place and organized the conference. I think you'll recognize this place. We're flying back to Heathrow over uh, Canary Wharf, over Tower Bridge. This is before the Shard went up and so it only remains to give you a brief update on what's happened since then well you may remember I showed the picture of the African Union building with all those steps going up well this is the new African Union building as from 2012 and I think you'd agree it is very impressive meanwhile in the slums Jemba was continuing to work prayerfully with uh, Christian colleagues. This is a gentleman, I think, from uh, Wayne Gordon over from America, who's supported the project in a very sustained way. Here's another view of the condominiums that were being built to take people out of the slums and into really good quality accommodation. Some of our friends from Glen Falls Fellowship flew over to Addis, a whole group of them, and they made a very good promotional video, which um, I'd recommend if, you've not, if you get a chance to, to find it on YouTube. It's called Just One. And our friend, the late Keith Holland, had a vision for stocking the library in the Institute for Urban Workers, which was completely devoid of books while we were there. And he raised a lot of money and arranged for all the books to be shipped out there. They were exactly the sort of books on urban development, which Jemba and the teachers needed for the local people. Another one of our friends, Dr. Greg Valerio, uh, had a passion for introducing Western teenagers to life in Ethiopia. And he set up a, a foundation which arranged that. And we don't know what effect this has had over the years, but I imagine many young people have been inspired since then to care 
for the urban poor. Another friend, Paul Wilson, continued his work of setting up a scheme to sponsor children for school purposes, particularly AIDS orphans. And there's even a part of this scheme which cares for the pensioners. So people can choose two or three of those possibilities. Jemba tended to fly over to the UK every autumn, also on her way to Chicago and other places where she would be a lecturer in the autumn. Here she is among some of her friends and we held a, a meeting for her on a regular basis. And she even came to one of our churches when I was a curate at uh, Great Whitcomb. So here we have from the left, David, her brother, and then Gemma herself, and uh, Lalo, her daughter, and, um, and there's Workner on the right with his wife. Sadly, she, she died. Yeah, I took a funeral service, and since then we've been doing what we can to help the family. We gave Gemma a uh, Lifetime Achievement Award on one of her visits, Chris Hughes has continued to be the treasurer for uh, fundraising purposes, doing that within the scope of uh, the Glenfall Fellowship and more recently Cheltenham Network Church. The Institute, which was being opened at the time we visited in 2004, has changed its name to Birhan College and is uh, coping well despite the challenges of the COVID pandemic, but they do need our prayers. Two of our friend's children visited uh, the project a few years ago. Lucy there was on her way down to serve in South Sudan, I think, and her brother working for a, a big financial institution in, in the UK, but putting quite a lot of his efforts into charitable work as well. Sadly, Workner, Jemba's, one of Jemba's sons had a, a stroke and that was about four years ago and he's suffered disability ever since. This was one of his birthday treats. He's been in a care home for the past four years. Well, he was in hospital for 18 months and he's been in a care home ever since. A terrible loss because he was such a gifted person. And then sadly... Jemba herself died uh, of an undiagnosed heart condition on the 6th of January this year. And we managed to be able to see something of the funeral. You can see people wearing masks. This is in Addis Ababa. And one of her friends, Anne Rispin, who'd done, done an awful lot to bring education to Ethiopians in Addis Ababa and in Veradar near Lake Tana, she gave uh, a tribute, which um, we managed to turn into another little video. But Jemba's life story was told in a very concise form in the Guardian obituary. And I'm grateful to Mike Barrett for writing that up. So a quick update on what else has happened since then. Down the Rift Valley, the National Park has now got a proper entry and exit arrangements with uh, uh, guided tours and some more bigger animals than were there previously. The crocodile market, so-called, has, has continued with uh, tours, but here we have the story of an Ethiopian pastor who was doing a, a baptism in Lake Charmo when something went dreadfully wrong. Sadly, he lost his life during that baptism. Must be a learning point there. The hotel we stayed at in Wondergenet has gone from sort of 1960s architecture to the space age with this new hotel and the hot pools that you saw. Remember those water spouts? It's now become a, uh, a proper swimming pool. Looks like fun. So that concludes the tour of Addis Ababa and the urban development project then down into the Rift Valley looking at the wildlife. I hope you've enjoyed it and see you again sometime.